I didn't know how close I was to the road. I thought like I was a hundred feet off the road or something, but I was actually only like 30 feet. Couldn't see the road. And a man came by in a pickup truck pulling an ATV and he s slowed down right where I was at. I think he saw me, but then he parked his truck and came walking into the woods. Uh, and I, Linda and I just stayed out of his sight. Looks like a really nice place to be buried. Couldn't be any more peaceful. There is nothing around here. This is an area called Black Horse in the mountains north of Great Basin National Park. Black Horse Eldridge Cemetery. And we see that Joe Eldridge still owns a ranch in here because we came across it when we were exploring. Well, this is Joe Eldridge's grave right here and his wife. He died in 2002. The family probably still owns the ranch in here. Gives you a feeling for how long people have been ranching this particular area here. The mining, there's that too. The oldest grave we can find here is this one. And it's just a baby. Tommy Eldridge, July 1911 to September 1911. I only showed you Joe Eldridge's grave because his name is on the uh, entrance to the gate here. And the rest of these graves are all fairly recent, 1990s and 2000s. It looks like the local ranchers here, or, or maybe the Eldridge family, I don't, I don't know. But it looks like they've chosen to be buried here. But it is open and we just thought we'd, you learn a little history when you come into a place like this. Well, yesterday was something else. Um, we camped night before last in the uh, National Forest up above Great Basin National Park. Uh, yesterday morning we left there and we drove to Ely to reprov reprovision. You know those things you gotta do? Groceries, gas, almost $4 a gallon. Um, do the laundry, wash the car, a lot of good that did. That, that's a story in itself. So we did all that. We met a really nice lady, uh, one of our subscribers. Her name's Laura. She's traveling with a one-ton Ford Dually diesel and a big camper on the back. Uh, really nice one, but she's got a better one ordered. She's waiting on an Arctic Fox so she can stay out longer in different seasons. She was interesting to talk to. I, I should have interviewed her, but we just didn't have time. Uh, Laura, thank you for talking to us, though. It was really nice speaking with you. But by that time, it was like 4.30 in the afternoon, so we just headed up this BLM road, and we ended up in this really beautiful spot. It's not level, but it's in these, I just love camping in the pinyon pines, and, and, and that's what we have here is junipers, or, or some people call them cedars, and pinions. And this is a beautiful, beautiful place peaceful and quiet. Level? No. We got one side of the trailer all propped up on rocks just to make it level. We bring those orange things that you stack, but they're, they're good to raise the tire up a couple inches, but we needed to raise it up like about this far. That's where we're at. Yeah, we're just waking up. <laughs> Why is it when there's something on your glasses, it's like right in front of your eyeball? I have no idea. And look, there's all kinds of room for it to land on. Everything is clear except for that one spot. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. No, I'll just smear it around. <laughs> there. Hmm. Oh, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting ready for go for a hike. We're going to go up the mountain here, follow the wash. The wash is full of flakes and we don't know why, either because it's either a trail. Oh, by the way, for you that don't follow this channel regularly, flakes are what's left over when um, when the Indians of old were making uh, arrowheads or making blades or scrapers, and they would leave these flakes of stone. And it's always nice stone. It's not just rock. It's beautiful stone because that's what it took to make arrowheads. 
but we're gonna, they're all in the wash. The wash is loaded. So it's one of two things. It's either a trail that the, that the uh, Indians followed all the time for thousands of years because of the, I can stoop down and pick up three, three flakes, just, just, you know, just like that. So it's so thick, it was used for many, many uh, um, centuries. It's either a trail or there's something up above that we need to see. And these have washed down because this they're all in a wash. So we're going to go explore that. If our rickety bones will carry us up the mountain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we look so energetic right now. You can see it happening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. There's one little white flake there. It's almost like a trail because if you get too far to the right or to the left, you, you don't see them anymore. Nice one here. And there's one right over here, a gray one laying there. There's another piece right there. One over here. So they're all just, they're everywhere. There's lots. All this means is they were really active, the Native Americans, the Indians, in this area, and they were traveling. They were going somewhere, walking along and making tools as they walked. That's the way they did it. Well, right here, there, 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 there. Where are you standing? I know, thousands of them. What we're trying to do now is to move as fast as we can going in this direction, yet stay on this trail. It's a pretty easy trail to follow. Hansel and Gretel couldn't have done a better job. Okay, I'm running out over here, so bear left, all right? Okay, back on it. Kind of a plateau up here. This is, would be a nice area to uh, hang out. It's up high, but it's flat, flat-ish. We'll have to go out in this direction and see if it keeps going up or what. Yeah. All right, let's check it out. Okay, the flakes seem to follow the left side of this hill. And there's a ravine down below, and you would think they would follow the ravine up rather than come on up on this hill just to go down again from here. I don't think they went down again, but it's hard to say. We're not in the same predicament or situation that they were in, it's really difficult for us to interpret what they would have done by what we would do today. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Yeah. I would have traveled just below this ridge line so I wouldn't be skyline. Is that the word? When you're standing up on the... Yeah, just below the ridge line. Well, that seems to be the trail is a lot. Let's, let's follow this out and... Because I've got trail of flakes to where I'm standing, so but I don't know if it goes to the left, down, or if it goes up there, or or what. So let's Try continue on. Try to go that way. Well, we're cutting down the left side of the hill, down lower. Kind of went up towards the top and ran out. Let me go that way a little bit. got a flake. Okay. I'll finish checking down here a little bit and then I'll come up and join you. Well, I went down the hillside and I've got nothing down here. So Linda found a flake up on top. So the main thing is we're just trying to stay on trail. I'm going to go up and join her. Yeah. Yeah, these. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, let's follow it out then. 
cool. Yeah, I see him. We're back on it. Real good. Well, we had to uh, give up on that. Um, boy, isn't this a beautiful place? Look at this. Uh, the road has switchbacks. And we came to a switchback. And I was, st I didn't know how close I was to the road. I thought like I was 100 feet off the road or something, but I was actually on like 30 feet. Couldn't see the road. And a man came by in a pickup truck pulling an ATV. And he s slowed down right where I was at. I think he saw me. But then he parked his truck and came walking into the woods. Uh, and I, Linda and I just stayed out of his sight. But anyways, we're working our way back down here. It's probably nothing, but it just made us uncomfortable. So uh, we're heading back down the mountain, back to camp. And the flakes kept going, though. The road goes ever on and on down from the door where it began. Well, we're back in our camp. Um, chances are the, the fella just stopped to, and maybe he didn't see me and he just stopped to go into the woods and go to the bathroom or something. There's always that. But you know, it was just a, it was just a little weird feeling. That's all. So better safe than sorry. And we kind of booked out of there, but we're back in camp now. And, you know, what do, would you say, Linda? We just prefer to be alone. <laughs> well, e even as a kid growing up, you know, in that place where I grew up, there was no neighbors, but any time we'd hike out to the highway, to cross the highway to go to the next uh, valley. Um, if we saw a car, we'd always hide. So for me, it's something I just do. Just a natural thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we're back. Uh, probably uh, start working on some lunch. Yep. Sounds good. You know, people have asked me why I don't wear shorts more often <laughs> and or or they've asked me what kind of hat I'm wearing or why I dress the way I do, you know, but basically I seldom wear shorts because of the kind of terrain that we find ourselves in all the time and mainly it's because of the brush and the scratches I'd get on my legs. But there's basically three reasons. Uh, one is the brush, protection from the brush. One is that ever since I was a little kid, I've been allergic to plants, not so much on my hands, I, although juniper is bad, but, uh, <laughs> but when I was a little kid, I'd lay down on the lawn, you know, with no shirt on and I'd itch like crazy getting up and my dad would say, oh, that's probably the chiggers. It wasn't. I react to the plants. I don't know what, they just make me itch. So that's another reason. And of course, number three is, uh, bug protection, mosquitoes, ticks, chiggers, things like that. We always spray around our pant legs and our shoes to keep uh, ticks from climbing up, discourage them from climbing up. And I always wear long sleeves, not always, but if I'm going out exploring, I'll either be wearing a long sleeve shirt or I'll have one with me. And it's the same thing. So I don't scratch my arms up going through the tight places. And that's, that's why I dress the way I do. I, I wear, Wrangler pants because they usually fit pretty good usually although if you buy a certain size Wrangler and Wrangler in one style pant it won't fit you in the next style Wrangler pant uh, I don't know they just don't all fit the same and um, out here you see me wearing this shirt all the time it's because it's really thin boy I'm wearing it out wearing it through at the elbows <laughs> but it's really thin cotton and it breathes so I don't perspire, but it shades my skin at the same time, protects me from the sun and the plants. The hat I'm wearing is because I don't want to sunburn the top of my bald head. I used to have, I used to be a hippie with long hair. Hey, um, this is called a, it's a Henschel Breezer. And this is my favorite hat because it's so ventilated and it breathes so well. And it protects my ears. I see in Montana, you see a lot of farmers that have skin cancer on the top of their ears, the farmers and the ranchers. Farmers mainly, because they wear baseball caps and it doesn't protect their ears. I see that a lot. So this shades the top of my ears. It shades the back of my neck. And of course, shades my eyes so I don't get the reflection in my, I'm wearing my clip-ons here, my favorite. 
and shades my eyes too. Also, I wear a uh, felt hat. It looks just like this one, but it's felt, and I wear that in the cooler temperatures. That also stands up to rain, that wool felt, and I treat it with a, with a waterproofing uh, spray also once in a while. But it takes quite a downpour to soak that wool felt hat, and it still remains warm. So I really like it. I do have my favorites. Boots, I tend to wear lightweight, all leather. They don't have to be waterproof because of where we like to explore. I have waterproof boots at home, mucks and things like that. In, in, uh, in Montana, that's necessary. But when we're exploring the desert, I like a lightweight leather boot to protect my ankles and my feet and also not a heavy clunky boot. I gave those up years ago. No more whites, no more heavy clunky leather boots. They have their purpose for the working man but not for a place where I'd actually rather be wearing running shoes. But a lightweight leather boot is what I wear. That's my choices. <sighs> you know, I heard Rick telling you all what he wore. And this is what I wear sometimes. Well, today. Starting at the top, because there's a lot in this five feet here, is my hat. Um, usually I wear a uh, floppy sun hat because um, I like to keep the sun off my face and neck and uh, shoulders as much as possible without using sunblock. And if I can't do that, then I do use lots of sunblock. Um, being a brown skinned person, you still have to think about the sun and the damage it does. And then uh, I also use, he normally you see me wearing that dark fleece, which I have in my backpack. And it looks like a fleece and it is a fleece, but it's about as effective as a lightweight flannel shirt. And I, so I can wear this on a day like today and not get overly hot because it breathes. And I like it because it has a hood. And I wear that to protect my arms because uh, from those scratches and brush. And I also like to wear leather gloves to protect my hands from the rough rocks and the branches and whatnot. And then I like to wear a loose top because I have to wear long pants. The loose top is, helps keep me cool. It catches any breeze and it breathes. It's, it's not a t-shirt clinging to you, making you sweat. And that's why I like to wear a loose top. And jeans, I like to wear jeans. Never wear black, especially in this kind of sun because it'll roast you out. Uh, and normally I like the boot cut jeans because it covers, you don't have to wear gaiters. The boot cut jean will cover your, the top of your shoes so you don't get um, cool, cool thorns. <laughs> you, so you don't get stickers and thorns in your shoe and socks. Um, but if you don't have those, like mine are dirty right now. So I wore these and these go straight down and they co actually cover my socks. So they're pretty good too. And then um, I've been wearing Keens since we, uh, for like 25 years. And these are the mesh ones. And I wear these in the hot deserty areas that we go to. And like Rick said, I also have waterproof Keens, which I wear in Montana during fall and winter. Good pair of wool socks and I'm good to go. And that's it. And I also make sure I have a, a belt, <laughs> a belted pair of pants, so you can put your essential tool back here when you're out in the wilderness. And my hat is cotton, it's actually crocheted and it breathes and it moves in the wind so it doesn't blow off my head 
and that's the reason why I wear floppy hats. Did I leave anything out? My stick. I like my stick to be longer than most people. Well, I guess a lot of people have long sticks, but I like them for those river crossings. <laughs> when you're going, going across a log, this will reach down to the bottom of the stream and still, I can still use it for balance. It also looks nicer, I think. Anywho, that's it. Yeah, we ended up here because of a wrong turn. Turns out it's a right turn. <laughs> yeah, it was just such a beautiful place to be. I always just take each day as it comes and whatever rolls my way, I just accept it. I figure for some reason God wanted me to be here and here I am. One of the things so nice out here is the fragrance of this pinyon pine and juniper forest. It's hard to describe, it's slightly sweet, uh, just fragrant, just beautiful. If you haven't experienced this, then Nevada is a good stop for you. It's a place you need to come out and explore. Well, we're back up where we were earlier today when we um, got a little spooked by that other person here and uh, went back down to camp. But he's gone, we came back up, and now we're continuing continuing on. It's kind of thick in here, but the trail the trail keeps going, the flakes, they're still here. I'm starting to get an idea what this is all about, but I'll share that with you here pretty soon. We have lost the trail, but we're cutting back and forth across it, looking for it again. Okay, we're back on it. Looking good. Just got to go through this. Here's the three possibilities that, that we see. Either this trail, which has been coming up this direction following this ridge line, either it curves and goes over this pass right here, or all of those flakes that we're seeing, perhaps the mountains up in here are a major source of the flint, the chert, the agate, whatever it is that they're using is coming from there. And they're going up there and getting it and then working it on the way down. The third possibility is that this trail that we've been following is like, it's like I-15 or I-25 meeting up with I-80 up here or I-40 following this, this line of mountains, which is perpendicular to the trail. That's another possibility. It's just a main travel route. Yeah, and this shoulder on the left that we followed all the way up, it goes all the way down to the valley floor down below. Hey, check this out. No kidding. You're kidding. Well, this gives you an idea of age of this trail. <laughs> Uh, I believe what we're looking at here is a Clovis point. This would be the bottom half of this point, this arrowhead. It has no ears on it, like no notches on it. It's, it's, yeah, it's thinned from the backside here. They, they thinned it from the notch. This looks like a Clovis point, and these are like, these are like 8,000 years old. And you just, did you pick this up just? Yeah. Just on the surface like that? Mm-hmm. Like all the flakes? Yeah. Holy moly. Amazing. Okay, go put that back. Okay. Well, let me explain what we did today. We came up so far up the ridge line, and then we went back up the up the shoulder of this mountain, and then we went back down and because of what happened earlier. <laughs> and then we explored down below that, 
uh, and then we came back up. This is a, a, a long shoulder coming off the mountain behind us. It's a long shoulder, rounded shoulder. Um, it's maybe a couple hundred yards wide and it goes all the way down to the valley floor below us. So, and then it comes all the way up as if it's a nice gentle climb all the way up to the mountain behind us and that pass. Now, what, did, what do you think that this trail is all about? Yeah, well, it is a major trail, but I think it's, a, it's also a major trail to go up to that mountain and get materials and go back down. Then that's entirely possible. It's either that or going over that pass up there, which is rounded, or meeting up with another perpendicular trail. We don't know. All we know is it goes all the way, we're pretty sure it goes all the way to the valley floor, all the way up. And that's what we were doing today. Just out hiking. <laughs> yeah, for a purpose, having fun. Yep. <laughs> Trying to figure things out in the desert. Well, pinion pine forest this time. <laughs> hey, thanks for coming along, you guys. Uh, hope we didn't bore you with this one. This was a typical day for Linda and I. Get out and explore. <laughs> if there's any young people watching, put yourself together a bit of a survival kit and head for the mountains and go do some exploring yourself in your, in your own in the own, your own state where you live. Go out and do some exploring. Yeah. It'll keep you in good shape and you might uh, just Get out in the outdoors. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. It'll keep you healthy and make you live long. See you around.